Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Human Element Series, Episode 173. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer, social-engineer.org, and the Innocent Lives Foundation. And I've been hosting this podcast now since 2009, which makes me old. So that's really a long time. I can't believe we had this podcast for that long. Uh, but I'm really excited about this episode. It's sponsored by social-engineer.com. You can check us out there. Brand new website. We just launched it. So hopefully you can give me some feedback on what you think. Uh, we rewrote everything, rebranded everything, rebuilt everything, uh, but still doing the same exact thing we've always been doing, which is focusing on the human element of security, helping companies learn how they can defend themselves against the malicious hackers out there. They're using phishing, vishing, smishing, and all the other ishings uh, to get your company and your people to do things they shouldn't do. So check us out there and uh, social-engineer.com. Let, us, let me know what you think about the new site. Uh, if you like the topic of social engineering, check our Slack channel out. Uh, we have over 1,100 people now every day, and they're talking about uh, different vectors they can use if you're a pen tester, or sometimes we have uh, we have eight people find jobs now on our job board in there. Uh, it's really, really great to hear that. Uh, we have students coming in, uh, learning uh, where they can go to learn more about the topics. Uh, just so many different things going on in the channel there. You can come on in and check it out. Uh, the the uh, invites in the show notes, or you can find it on the Human Hacker Twitter account. It's uh, stuck there up on the top. If you can't find it, just ping me, and I'll send it over to you. And if you're interested in training, please uh, head back over to social engineercom Check out our whole training schedule. We heard all of the things that everyone said, and we finally did what you asked, which is put a whole year's worth of training schedule out there. So we have an APSE class coming up uh, August uh, one through four, I think it is on the website. And we have a practical OSINT class on, on the website too. It's a virtual class in September. That's a two day class. And there's just a whole bunch of different trainings on there. So you can go and check that out at social-engineer.com. And, um, I just want to say again, we, we listened to what you said. I knew it's frustrating that they weren't out there. So we fixed that problem and a huge shout out for clutch. If you don't know them, then you're living under a rock for the whole, your whole life. Go listen to that band, pro-rock.com. They give us the intro music for the podcast here. And, of course, as anyone who knows me knows, I'm a massive fan of Clutch. And my, Neil Fallon is a good friend of mine and is on the board of the Innocent Lives Foundation, uh, which leads me to my very last announcement, which is please check out the innocentlivesfoundation.org. Uh, the work we're doing there is – I'm just blown away by my team. We are now over 600 cases worked uh, for the five years that we've been alive uh, we have some amazing stories coming out. Um, my team has been working so hard. We've been a part of some really big operations in the last 12 months that has led to some really significant arrests, stopping a lot of really bad people and saving a lot of kids. Uh, so there's some information on InnocentLivesFoundation.org. You can check it out. And of course, if you want to volunteer, you can sign up there. If you want to help us out with donations, you can do that there. Uh, you can find many ways to support us. But I just want to thank everyone for the support there for that. Okay, let's get over to our guest now. Uh, one of my good friends, Lori Siegel, we have her here today. Uh, Lori is the founder of Dot Dot Dot, a media company focused on onboarding the mainstream into the new era of the internet focused on Web3. Uh, I've known Lori for well, a really long time, actually back when she was uh, an award-winning journalist at CNN and was 60 Minutes. Uh, but she's been doing this now for quite a while, even though she looks really, really young. But her <laughs> resume is quite impressive, right? Um, she's interviewed some of the world's most influential tech people. Like she's interviewed Mark Zuckerberg, Tim Cook. Uh, you could just see her interviews online and see all the people that she's had a chance to talk to. She was a CNN senior tech correspondent covering technology and culture for over a decade. And before that, with 60 Minutes and, of course, now with her own company, um, and an author, a brand new book called Special, Special Characters, which we are here to talk about today. Lori, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's so good to be here. It's, it's been a long, a long career you've had, um, <laughs> which you outline in the book, which I, I've known you for a while, but I didn't know your start. Um, <laughs> I, I love the opening when you talk about this 4 a.m., <laughs> walking through um, east side there in New York City right. where a couple of cops think that you're you're drunk walking yeah. and you end up getting your first day ride with a cop car. Yeah, that's right. The, I, the start of your career in the back of a cop car. Yeah, I mean, it's, it kind of computes, <laughs> right? <laughs> like I feel like I was always like one step away from being in a cop car and, and yeah. way, right? But uh, yeah, it was, I, I think it's, it's always easy. I think part of writing the book 
was like trying to turn the camera around and show like mm. like a career is not a like a linear straight line, you know, and and how it, things actually happen. And so I think uh, it does sound like a pretty fancy bio when you say it all like <laughs> that, but like you know, it all I mean it really did um I started at the bottom of the bottom and, you know, at the CNN news desk doing breaking news, but I was a news assistant. When you talk about being a minnow and like a sea of sharks, <laughs> it's like, it's like eat or be eaten kind of, kind of situation, um, in 2008, but it was my first day going to work. I remember I was 23 years old. It was like, I was right out of college. I was, um, and I had gotten a freelance position at CNN and it was like my dream job to work in the news business. And I was on my way and it was like, my shift began, I think, at like 6 a.m. So it was like 4, 4.30, some, somewhere in those wee hours. And like the drunk NYU kids were still all out and about. <laughs> and I was like, you know, like attempting to walk to the subway in heels. And I'm pretty sure I looked drunk. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I and, and a cop car pulled over and asked if I, I was okay. And by the way, I should, I should be super self-aware and think like how privileged am I also to have a cop car like – like pull over and, and say something nice to me. And <laughs> like, yes. um, you know, like I, I, I probably got a, a lot different treatment, but it was, it was, um, I ended up riding in the back of the cop car. They said like, Oh, do you need a ride? And I was like, okay. And I rode in the back of the cop car to, um, to CNN and hoped that no one would see me get out of a cop car to work. And I was like, I don't want to take, if they're going like, to give me a ride and I have to take the subway, I'll, I'll do it. I'll take um, it. And yeah. so, and so I, I did. Um, and that was my first day at CNN. I just remember walking in and you're at the breaking news desk and you know, I was, it was actually my birthday. It was August 18th. It was my birthday. And like I told no one it was my birthday and I, (laughs) I sat there and you know, you've got cameras stretching everywhere. Like, and it was, I had Googled all the producers. Um, and, uh, before I had gotten there, the producers I'd be working for. And it was like, they were the producers, like old school news producers that had like mm-hmm. run towards the buildings on 9-11 to report the news. Like they were um, as old school news as you got. And so I just knew I'd be kind of training under the best. Um, and so that was the beginning of my career. And it was such an exciting time because 2008, we had the recession. I mean, it was such an extraordinary time where there was recession. Barack Obama elected president of the United States you know, you had Bernie Madoff in that scandal, which I, I, I covered and I was, you know, trying to scheme my way around the courtroom for, for coverage. And there were just, it was such an interesting time to be in breaking news, especially if your heart and soul was like in journalism, which it always has, my, mine always has been. So that, that really is the question. Is this, is this what you knew you wanted to do? Is this, was this your goal was to, to be in journalism your whole life? Yeah. I mean, I always loved stories and I always loved writing. Like I was like the kid who um, had like a pen and paper attached at my in my hip. I was like keeping a journal for as long as I could write. Um, but I I loved um, I loved alternative viewpoints and looking around the corners. Right. So when I when I was in um, high school, I grew up in a very southern conservative um, environment. I was like the only Jewish girl at a very Christian conservative southern school. Um, where there wasn't a lot of diversity. And I always kind of felt a little bit, um, a little bit like a, an outsider in my own, in my own way. Um, and you know, I, I think for me, like writing and telling other people's stories was my way. I felt like I f- always fit or I found, um, I, I, I enjoyed people and I enjoyed people that other people didn't pay attention to. I was, um, editor of my school newspaper, the Crimson and Gold back at uh, my school in, in Georgia. And I remember they gave me a column called Spotlight where I could spotlight anyone I wanted and write an article about. So instead of like going to like the star athletes, I would go to like the library lady who was like 90 <laughs> years old and everyone would like, was weird, thought it was so weird, but I thought she was so fascinating and like had all these like weird biblical secrets and like, <laughs> you know, and I think my breakthrough moment, um, was interviewing uh, a, our track coach who was also like, I mean, maybe I just loved old people because they were wise, <laughs> but like he was like 80 something years old and people used to always make fun of Coach Red because he couldn't really run a lap, obviously, because he was like 80 and and he was like just kind of like sleepily directing, you know, very fast people from afar. Um, but I always <laughs> thought there was more to it. And I remember sitting down with him to, um, to write a piece about him for Spotlight and 
getting him to open up and we were like on the, the mats in the school gym and getting him to open up about, um, who he actually was and how he had fought in the war and he had like found his wife and he had like mm-hmm. almost, and, and he, he talked about like falling in love and then he opened up and out of nowhere he had like tears and he was talking about, um, having Parkinson's and like how he was, he had just been diagnosed. I mean, it was this, this crazy, wow. it was this crazy moment where you learn someone's true self and how incredible they are beyond what other folks see and the nuance of it. Um, and instead of it just being a sleepy track coaster in front of me, I saw like a war hero who like fell in love and who was now looking at mortality and like, and it was for me, I was just like, God, I'm going to like do this the rest of my life. Like I love that mm-hmm. moment when just the curtain falls. Um, and I feel like we all have those moments. And, and so later in my career, I took that from everyone from like, you know, misunderstood hackers to the Mark Zuckerbergs yeah. of the world, right? Like really trying to find the humanity in people and, and really trying to understand why we are the way we are and why we do the things we do, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the chaotic. Um, and I've always taken that approach into my reporting. But I I really, it started with this, um, just like this interest and curiosity in people. And, and I think what I would say is misfits, like mm-hmm. um, people that were a little misfitty. <laughs> and that's how I got into technology yeah. at CNN. I, I looked for the misfits um, back in, and that's how I, I kind of created our startup beat um, at CNN. It was, we, there was this confluence of events, which was the iPhone had come out. I don't know the exact year, but it was the iPhone came out, the app store launched, and then we were in the recession. And like, there was this moment of creativity and all of a sudden it wasn't cool to go to wall street anymore. And there was this canvas of creativity. And if you were an entrepreneur, you could code your idea into like the hands of millions of people. And you just had all these people that were like, I don't know, why do we have to do things the way they should be done? Like, why can't we get into strangers cars and sleep in strangers homes and call it Airbnb and Uber? And like, and that was so interesting to me. I mean, now, fast forward all these years, so much complication, so many complications happened. And I challenged a lot of these leaders along the way. But I liked that they were kind of a little punk rock back in the day. Mm-hmm. I, I want to back up to this, this because this is a fascinating piece. I don't think I ever heard from you in all of our years of conversation. Mm-hmm. So you're in high school and you have this fascination with people that leads you to interview Literally the opposite that would make you popular in 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 school. <laughs> yeah. What? Where did you get that? What? Where, where did you come up with the desire to actually want to interview these unique, interesting? What What might have turned out to be the most boring interviews on the yeah. planet, but they sound amazing. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think like I think it was probably, you know, I um. Probably a, I grew up in a bit of a snobby suburb of Atlanta, mm. Georgia. I mean, it's still nice. And I say, I'd like to say nice ish things about it, but my parents got divorced. You know, my, um, my brother went to boarding school. Like, I didn't have, um, and it wasn't like a woe is me, but I didn't have the most n- normal, I think, upbringing. I was very much my mom's partner to some mm-hmm. degree, um, when I didn't see my dad as much. And I, and I think, um, for me, I grew, I grew up kind of quickly and I had a lot of empathy for people who I felt were unseen. You know, I think, um, just maybe there was something about how I grew up and some of the pain at home that I liked to channel into other people who I thought deserved to be seen. You know, I loved, if people look the other way, I loved proving them wrong. Um, I, I, I hated the snobbiness of the suburbs and I don't, I didn't like that. Some of the moms wouldn't talk to my mom after like my parents got divorced. Like it's all seems so small, you know, it all seems so yeah. small and lame. And, um, and I think for me, it was being able to, um, to channel that into having opinions and taking a stance on things and like writing op-eds on like, you know, things that were like kind of like no brainers. Like, God, I remember writing an op-ed on like, why gay couples should be able to adopt, which is like, uh, okay, like this is not like, I can't even believe like I'm writing an op-ed. Like there was like a he said, she said column. I'm like, <laughs> who's on the other side of this? But there were people on the other side. And and um, I felt maybe 
in my own life because there was so much chaos going on at home um, with uh, with some of the, my family stuff. Um, I sometimes I had this ability to kind of um, be a chameleon and fit anywhere and, and and navigate chaos very well, which very much benefited me later in my career. Like I've like, you know, done stories on terrorists and knocked on terrorist doors and like gone in really chaotic situations. And I feel like I'm actually like better in chaos sometimes than like normal situations. Um, but I do think that it really got me interested in in the things that we don't see and and the things that mm-hmm. we ignore. Um, and, and I loved to read people and wonder what they were really thinking. And, and I think that just stemmed from a lot of empathy that came from watching some things in my, my family probably early on, to be honest with you. I love that answer. Um, because honestly, hearing it now, knowing you, that fits so well. Well, you're it just trying so to create perfect. a social engineering profile on me. So if you ever no. need to steal any of my data, I am so screwed, by the way. No, like, no, never. I would never. But, I'm so screwed. But, <laughs> I'm thinking about how you and I met when it came up to the revenge porn story. And you yeah. wrote about that in, in, in your book. Um, mm-hmm. That was a time when people weren't focusing on that. People yeah. were almost like, well, it's kind of your fault. You let him take the pictures. Yeah. Like almost blaming right. the women for letting it happen. Yeah. And you took that, you took that, I mean, you took that to 60 minutes. You took that right on mm-hmm. television. You took that national mm-hmm. worldwide yeah. When it was an unspoken story. Yeah. I mean, it just pissed me off. Like, it's like, it's these things I think I feel like that's what I mean about being unseen. Like, it didn't seem fair. And like, and anyone who says that journalists like don't have a take on things is like, mm-hmm. or any journalists that say they're completely neutral, I think it's kind of, I'm sorry. Like, I had a take. And like, my take was that it's not okay that there's this emerging type of cyber harassment happening and that the laws haven't caught up. And that it's happening and it's going viral and like no one's there to help. And it was largely happening to women and and no one's there to help these women. And like, and and not only is no one there to help them, but like they're being told by like, like old boring judges that they like shouldn't have taken a photo of themselves, which is like, you shouldn't have worn the short skirt. Like, and it was just, and, and for me, it was just like, we have to call attention to this, but, and it's how we called attention to it. Like, you know, I think, um, at the time, I remember we had interviewed a woman named Nikki who um, – and to this day, I think she's probably one of my favorite interviews I've, I've ever done. Like I just remember going to her home in San Diego and she's this beautiful woman who um, – she should have been the most – I want to say like you could tell she's so full of energy. She's so – full of light. And there was this darkness that hung over her and you could feel it because it was palpable because she had had this boyfriend that she called, um, sarcastically, Mr. Wonderful, who had taped her without her consent. Like he had literally a pin cam, like cameras with pins in them. Um, and he had taped her against her will and he put all her images on the internet and, and he, you know, with the words, bitch, slut, whore under it, it was horrible. And, you know, and, and she said, she, you know, it was hard for her to get jobs because she said, every time I go in, I wonder if you've seen me naked. And it was such a powerful statement. Um, you know, and, and I just, I remember sitting across from her, um, and, and I remember like, all I wanted to do was hug her the whole time, which like, I'm not yeah. allowed to do. Like, you gotta like have some boundaries. And I was like, it's not about me. It's about her. But like, I just, my heart felt for this girl, but it was cool to give her a platform because I, I felt like she, we were giving her a platform to change her Google search, right? Like that was kind of cool. Like we literally could give her a platform to take that power back. And, and I remember sitting there at the end of the interview and her saying to me, um, I said, what would you say to him if he was here today? And she said, I'd say thank you. And I was like, oh, why? Ooh, that <laughs> you know? actually gives me chills. I know. And she's like, thank you for making me like the best version of myself. Like, wow. and you just saw like this strength and like this badass, incredible human. And I wanted the world to see her like that because it just – it broke my heart. Um, and, and then there were all these things that just pissed me off. Like, I think maybe I've just been pissed off for a while. Like it bothered me. One thing the, and this is how stories always came to me. Like one thing the, her lawyer, a woman named Elisa said was, yeah. And it's so crazy. Like in order to like get photos down, you know, you have to copyright, you have to own the copyright. So in some of these cases, like women have to expose themselves further and like send naked images or uh, that's what they said. She said, you have to own the copyright. So you have to get the copyright from 
um, the copyright office. And I was like, and I just, I was like, wait a second. So does this mean you have to send your naked photos to like, to some like old dudes at a copyright office in DC? Yeah. And she was like, yes, it does. And so we went undercover. <laughs> like remember Erica and I, my producer, we were like, we were just like always an out, like a probably <laughs> like, uh, we're probably always like a phone call away from the back of the police car. <laughs> um, but we decided to, um, test out the theory and I called up the copyright office and, and it was, DC, New York, so one party consent. So they didn't have to know we were taping them. So that's an important one, as you probably know better than anyone. Yeah. Um, we did our homework. Um, and I called and I said, you know, if I'm a bit, if I had a naked photo taken, like I really want to get it taken down. Do I need to send you my naked photos? And she was like, honestly, yeah. And it's horrible. And I'm really sorry. But like, we've had a lot of women call in with this problem. And I wish there was something else. And I'm just like, this is so horrible. Like none of this that is horrible. It's horrible. And so I was really happy that we put it out there and we did this. And, um, but I've always just been passionate about those types of, of stories. And, and I think it goes back to like Annabelle, the library lady, like, I mean, mm. guaranteed, probably not a victim of revenge porn. It was way before mm. her time. Um, but I, I think like, you know, I just thought like she just has like an interesting story. She probably has something to say. And we, we can't just dismiss people because they don't fit into our box, you know? Um, and so yeah. I've always liked looking at people with uh, with some kind of empathy. And I think that's always been a through line in my reporting. Yeah, it's a fascinating um, storyline. And, and it seems like, you know, so you, you moved through your career. You started your own media company. You're nowhere near done. I mean, mm -hmm. you have so much more to accomplish. Yeah. But then you decided to write a book about your life, okay, special character. So let's talk about uh -huh. that. What yeah. motivated you to actually write a book about your life when you have so much more to do? You know, I think it was more like I remember going in. I left CNN in 2019, um, and I really wanted to write a book. I'd always loved to write. My dream had always been to write a book. And and I remember um, a couple things happened. Michael Lewis, the author, is a friend of mine, and and he was. I was telling him the story once of how like we turned all my data, like my text message data, with my best friends. I gave it all to like um, an entrepreneur who does AI chatbots, and like she created the Lori bot, like yeah. with my personal data. Which, by yeah. the way, hi privacy, <laughs> goodbye. <Yeah. laughs> you know, but like we had like a digital copy of me, and my bot was. In which was like wow. super upsetting. Right. And so I had to put my bot in time out and I was telling Michael the story like over, um, it's like over breakfast uh, one day. And he was like, God, like the way you tell the story of tech is through your own lens. And I, and I just kind of like shelved it and ignored it and like went on with my day. But I do remember, um, I went into my, I, I got connected to a book agent who I really liked and, and she was a young woman, a younger, she's, you know, a younger woman. And, and I, and I was talking to her about, and I sent her a bunch of writing samples. Um, and she just said, you've got to do a memoir. Like you've seen so much interesting stuff. Like you were, and, and I think it almost took someone saying that to me because I did. I mean, I was on the ground floor um, for history. I, I mean, it's absurd, I think, to be 36 years old and like writing a memoir. Like, you know, it's like, what do I, you know, but, but at the same time, I created our startup beat at CNN when, and had early access to the people yeah. and, and challenged a lot of them and was on that journey. My, my journey in media was parallel to the journey of many of the entrepreneurs I met. Um, and so it was interesting to kind of document that rise from the hype. And first of all, the band before the band got cold to, <laughs> you know, to everyone cares to the hype, to the power, to the money, to the privacy, to the bad, you know, and, and also, you know, pull out a lot of themes. And, and I think I could have written a book, um, that was all about like a hardcore business book or like a tell all mm. book on, you know, Facebook or whatever it was, but I really wanted to write a book that I would have wanted to read in my twenties or, you know, or even my thirties, like about change and about, um, and about chaos and about, um, imposter syndrome and about how things look from the outside, but how things are from on the inside. Um, and, and so that's what special characters is. It's a, it's a memoir that really looks at the last decade of technology, but through the lens of someone who's growing up in it and who's putting a lot of these founders on for the first time. And we're all growing up together. You know, they were all baby face entrepreneurs promising to code a better world when I met them, you know? Um, and so it's, it's a really interesting time and I wanted to honor it. I mean, I have so many notes and, and there was so much, um, 
I did. I felt like nice to kind of put my stake in the ground a bit, you know? How long did it take to write? Oh, God. You know, you write books. Like anyone who says writing a book is like a fun process, I just don't oh, trust God. at all. I don't know. Like they did yeah, not write the book. If they say it's then. fun, they have a problem. They, if they say it's fun, then they had a post writer. <laughs> that is my way of thinking. Like, yeah. Because it's a creative process and it's hard. But it probably took me – I sold the book in 2019, um, September, October, and then and then the pandemic came. And I probably started full on started April, May and ended in October, November. I wrote it quickly. Wow. It was awful. It was awful. And I was running a company at the time. Um, I mean, I'm still running my company. I was like, I was doing both. Um, You had no life. I had no life. I didn't take a day off. Um, for many, no, you can't write that. You can't write a book in, in that's like what, five months, six months. Yeah. You said April to October. Yeah. And then, I mean, but then we, you know, then I got, I did some rewrites and all that kind of stuff, but that's when I turned to my manuscript. Still, that's like seven months. It was crazy. So. It was crazy. I would like sit and, but it was during the pandemic and I don't like writing alone, like in, in a, the isolation of a room. So I would go to this little cafe. Um, co- it was like a little coffee shop downtown in New York. And like at the, now it's like a full blown, like they've built it out. But like when I went, they just had like a tiny little wooden table outside because like, <laughs> like it was total pandemic mode, New York, and there was nothing. Yeah. And so I would sit on the cement, like on the floor, on the ground, the New York streets surrounded by papers and my laptop. And I did like old journals and I just wrote. Wow. And then I was also traveling for 60 minutes. So I'd be like, you know, I'd be like on my way to a QAnon convention to do stuff on conspiracy theorists. And then like, I would come back to the hotel room and write like, and, and right. So it was so weird. I mean, it was a lot. It was a lot. Like I, you know, I want to, I'd like a nap, but it was. Yeah. Good. Wow. That's an interesting part of the story there because I, you know, having written before, I mean, seven months to do a whole book, Crazy. even if it's about you, it's still, that's a lot of, you have a lot of stories and you have to remember them and oh my God. make sure they're accurate. That's Crazy. a lot of detail. It was Crazy. It was, it was insane. My, my team was able to help a little bit for dot, 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 like, because one of my team members went and looked through and found all the video archives of like a lot of the interviews I did and had them transcribed. So, you know, I, I actually had some help in that, like without that documentation, I mean, like, and so each chapter when I was like, all right, I'm going to go through this, 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 and this, this is the Zuckerberg Cambridge Analytica. I interviewed Zuckerberg during Cambridge Mm -hmm. Analytica. It was his like, I'm sorry interview. Like, here's the interview, here's the like transcript. And then like, I would send, I would send like copies. Oh my God. I would send like, I, cause I wrote, I journaled. I would send pictures of my journal to one of my like employees who, by the way, I should never piss off because she probably knows more about me now than like <laughs> most people and she would get them all transcribed. So it was like, wow. I mean, it was crazy. And like, and she probably like literally knows like my deepest fears now, which is horrifying. So, you know, but it is a very personal book if you read it. I mean, like, yes, you know, there's, yeah, some, I mean, there's some stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, there's going to have to be a, a part two in the next 10 or 15 yeah. years when you accomplish yeah. the rest of your things, you know, so. because I, so. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a fascinating process. Uh, I think in speaking to a lot of authors myself, mm-hmm. um, that I haven't heard someone write a book in that manner. Yeah. Like a lot of people, like, I, you know, I, I talked to Joe Navarro and he writes a book and he doesn't even turn, he doesn't even turn the idea in until the book is basically written. And then he goes to his agent and says, Hey, I have a book and you know, here's an outline and tell me if you like it. And then I, and then he, then he can turn it in. And I'm like that. I don't know if I can do that. That's, That's a lot crazy. of commitment. That's crazy. Right? That's a lot. But, That's a lot. of. But you did it in yeah. six to seven months. It was which, I mean, I, I like have PTSD, even like saying it, I'm like, I don't, I can't even like, <laughs> I mean, but, I'd have to quit my job and everything in my life to do that. In I mean, six or it was seven during months. the pandemic. I was balancing sixty minutes running a company, and um, and I fell in love, and and that was like when I found my fiance. <laughs> so, I feel like I'm kind of one of those people. I'll just like get a lot of shit done at once. Like I like yeah. get a lot of like whatever at once, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, seriously, because I mean, and pandemic, which made everything twice as difficult. Totally, but it was such a weird time. It was a kind of um. It was a weird time and everything was upside down. Not saying everything's right side up now, but everything was really upside down. So like, you know, I don't know. It was kind of, it was the worst. It was a bad time to feel like I didn't want to write about myself. Like that felt gross to write about myself at a time Mm. when the world was just like falling apart. 
but it was like an interesting time to be really introspective. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad I was able to do it. Um, you know, I'm going to definitely like not want to ever do that for a while. again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, here's the thing though, is uh, I said that after I wrote my first book, I said, okay, that was a great experience. I'm never doing that again. Right. Four books later, I say the same thing after I write every book. Okay, that was it. I'm never doing that again. It's crazy. You know, but there is, um, when I left CNN, I remember it was 2019. Um, I had interviewed Zuckerberg like four or five times in, in the last couple of years. Hmm. I had just, um, I just finished a series called The Human Code. Um, this is why we've always related. I'm always interested in the human aspect of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had interviewed Dara, the CEO of Uber, and Mark Benioff, and and Tim Cook, and and every tech titan you could you could name. Um, and I just was I was so ready to go. Like I really wanted to go create my own thing. I really wanted to do different types of journalism that didn't quite fit with the way cable news was headed. I had all sorts of um, ambitions like that that I was ready for. And and I um I had become obsessed. This is a theme in the book. I had become obsessed with this this theme. Um, uh, well, I'd become obsessed with a YouTube video at the time of a rabbi, and I'm like not super religious, so like I wasn't like browsing like Jewish YouTube just for the record. Um, <laughs> but I had like discovered this YouTube video of a rabbi talking about how lobsters grow, um, and it was so funny. Like the rabbi's like looking into the camera, giving like a sermon on lobsters, which is ironic (laughs) that rabbis are kosher and don't eat lobsters. Um, But he was like talking about how the only way for lobsters to grow um, is they have to completely shed their shell. But Mm -hmm. like, it's the most stressful moment for lobsters. It's like the worst thing to happen to a lobster is like they have to grow and they're super vulnerable at the time because they're just like this, like, you know, naked thing that could be eaten. So like, you, the only way for lobsters to grow is to completely shed the shell. And it's such a great metaphor for change. And I thought it was such a great metaphor for so many of the entrepreneurs I've interviewed and for my career too, like this idea of like to have any type of real success, um, you have to go through that discomfort that comes mm-hmm. along with it. And even though it might look good on the outside, like when you say my bio and it's like 60 minutes and CNN senior tech correspondent has her own company, has a book, like maybe it looks so good from the outside, but like that is not without like some painful lobster moments, yeah. right? Like the, this idea of like shedding your shell to get bigger um, and being very vulnerable and super stressed out and like failing a bunch in between. Right. And, and so I thought that was an important yeah. theme and that's like a theme throughout the book, but it's funny when I left, um, CNN in 2019, I was like negotiating with Jeff Zucker and like, you know, Jeff, like, um, well, you, you don't probably know Jeff, but, um, <laughs> but the world knows Jeff probably, or like anyone following media probably knows Jeff, but I, Jeff was always my mentor and he was, we were like going, you don't negotiate with Jeff. He's like a hard person to negotiate with. He's like super good at what he does, obviously. <laughs> and he was like, just stay, like, give me five interviews a year, this and that. And I had like practiced my I'm quitting speech, like literally to everyone. And um, and I was ready to go. And I was like, this is it. And it was hard because I my whole identity was being Lori from CNN. And I was like, whoa, like who am I without this? Like, but I am so ambitious. I have all these other things I wanted to do. Um, that didn't include kind of breaking down technology and, and a lot of the stuff into increasingly small sound bites on television. I just, there's too much more I wanted to do. Um, and increasingly I had a take having like spent all this time in this world and seeing where things go wrong and right. Like I increasingly wanted to have a voice and a take in, in these emerging fields of the internet. And so, you know, we we're going back and forth and he was like, kind of negotiating me out of my own head. Like I was like Mm. about to just like give it all up. And then I remember being like, Jeff, I have to tell you how lobsters grow. And like, that was it. I told Jeff Zucker how lobsters grow and he let me quit my job. Like, wow, he let me go. He was like, I understand. He's like, you want to fly? I was like mixed metaphor, but yes. (laughs) And and I still, lobsters don't fly. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and like I, and, but that's always kind of been our joke since, but I think it's such a, a good reminder for folks. And and that's like a message I want people to understand in the book that like, no matter how much we put people on pedestals who are successful, the people on the front of magazines and all this stuff, like it's a mess behind the scenes. Like when you turn Mm. the camera around, whether it's Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey 
or even looking at the career of someone who's successful in media, like it takes a lot to get to where you are. And it takes a lot of shedding your shell and growing a new one and having courage and being resilient and being vulnerable and being stressed. So I, I thought that was like a good thing that like, I, if we could kind of put out something that's a little universal, yeah, people might relate to. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that messaging because, um, I think that is the case. I think I do that. Sometimes you look at people in my industry who are super successful and yeah. you think, wow, they just, they must have just fell into the, the puddle of luckiness. Right. You know? totally. But then when you sit and talk with them, you hear the pain and suffering they totally. went through to get to where they are. Yeah. That's and great. It, it wasn't just like someone handed them a $10 million business or something. You know, they had to bleed along the way to get there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that's yeah. like an important, um, it's important for us to understand that and to honor that for everyone who wants to build companies or wants to do anything, or wants to do anything worth it. Right. Like it, um, I think it's so easy for us to just kind of like simplify things and create these narratives of around success. Um, you know, especially now. So that's, that was important for me to have come through in the book. So you did it. You stepped out. You quit this very secure, good job, yeah. and you started dot, dot, dot. Uh -huh. uh, how's it been going? How, how is it? It's been good. Well, some days it feels like getting punched in the face, but like <laughs> other days it feels good. And, you know, I think that's that's building a company, right? Like we launched a company in time yeah. for the pandemic. <laughs> like well, I mean, that is nuts awesome. in itself. <laughs> you know, and so we were operating as a production company for a while and have shows in development with different streamers and have like podcasts and all that kind of stuff. The book is actually a product of the company, which is cool. Um, and so um, it's been really good. And it's been, honestly, if anything, it's been, I've learned so much and I've grown so much and I think I'm a different person, you know, a, in a good way. Um, and, and increasingly, you know, I, I took us on, I would say kind of a, I hate to use the word pivot, um, but I am transforming us a little bit because I want us to be a platform for people to understand the next generation of the internet. Like mm -hmm. when my radar went off and the same way my radar went off in 2009 and I was like, Oh wow. Like, you know, startups, like this thing that no one's paying attention to, these people are going to break shit. Like it's going to be really interesting. I feel that again happening, um, with web three. And I, and I, you know, I don't think it might just look like what we're talking about with just like oversimplified, narratives around crypto, right? Like I actually think with Web3 and this idea that we're all entering a more immersive world where we can have conversations like this with ease in a way that we didn't mm -hmm. used to, um, you know, this idea that digital ownership could be a thing that we could actually like own part of our digital identities. Like there are these really extraordinary concepts that are coming um, that could have real implications for what I love to do, which is cover the human side of technology. So everything mm -hmm. from how we raise our children to politics and democracy, to the way we love all of it, um, the finances and, you know, you name it. And so that's really exciting to me. So now we've really kind of moved into trying to build out a network to help people understand Web3 uh, and, mm. and ask some of these more challenging and ethical questions up front. Um, because we're building out a new internet infrastructure right now. Like we don't yeah. have to like shame on us if we don't take what we learned from the last decade of tech where you and I both know a lot of shit went wrong, you know, it's yeah. super exciting. Like we both love it, right? Like I wouldn't trade it for anything, but right. a lot of stuff yeah. went, went wrong. And so how do we build out, you know, these new, uh, this new infrastructure. And I like to take a lot of the access cause I know a lot of folks now having been there from the beginning, um, and ask these folks those questions and build out a platform um, to do that and, and to really help people understand it and get more different types of people building. Um, and so that's been that's been uh, one of our, our different initiatives. And it's it's been rewarding and hard and all the things, you know. And this is also a fascinating um, transformation for you because it seems like you, you took your, your life goal of becoming a journalist. Mm -hmm. And now you took all those wonderful connections you made in being a journalist and you're not just staying a journalist, yeah. which you are, but you're, yeah. you're now transforming it into actually helping make a difference and yeah. make a change in, in things. I think it's a weird space because sometimes I, I always fall into storytelling, right? I, I think storytelling is like my bread and my butter. And, and like, I literally, I mean, I've heard of an NFT project the other day that like where the, the founders are, were connected to like a suicide cult. And I'm like, we got to go do that. So we got to like, we got to get in there. <laughs> we got to roll up our yeah. sleeves and really like cover some of the implications of this. And so I think it's hard because I, I wear two hats now, right? One is really trying to explain and storytell. And one is really trying to kind of build 
a business and also, you know, really try to help people kind of understand these and use and utilize some of my contacts to really try to help do what I, to put my money where my mouth is a bit. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they feel like they conflict in some ways transparently. And, yeah. and so, um, it's been something that I've been navigating and it's something I'm, I'm still truthfully stepping into a little bit, but I, I do, I do, I did have this realization that I I know a lot of people might think it's like fancy to be on television, right? Like, and, and it is, I can go be on TV, you know, and do shows and do that kind of stuff. But that's, but I want, there's a lot more things I want, um, than doing a TV show on this type of stuff. I really want to be able to, uh, roll up my sleeves and, mm. and impact in a different way. And, and going back to that idea of like, I do have a take, you know, I'm not this neutral person who doesn't have a take on the way things are. I've seen too much. You know, yeah. I, I've seen where things go wrong. Um, I've sat across from a lot of these entrepreneurs and asked some of these questions. And, and so I'd like to be able to like try my hand at, at actually being able to help and, and build a better world. So, you know, it's, it's certainly, um, it's certainly interesting and I'm certainly learning a lot, but I feel like, God, I wouldn't change it for anything, you know? Yeah. yeah I love this story. This is great. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm excited to see what you do next. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, Lori, uh, when we have people on and we hear stories like this, which is just amazing, you know, they always have at least one or two or maybe more people who mm -hmm. they consider mentors through their life. Who would you consider to be your, your biggest mentors that helped you get to where you are right now? Well, I feel like I've had a lot of people who kind of stepped stepped into my life and really stepped up for me and, and kind of gave me the courage to believe in myself. Um, there was a woman, she's actually, she's in the book. Her name is Susan Grant. She was, she used to head up CNN digital and I liked her because she was like the opposite of like a CNN executive. Like she was just like this like badass woman had like leather bracelets half the way up her <laughs> arms. Like she was so funny, had like a great sense of humor. And I remember, um, I had started covering technology on the side um, I wasn't doing it as a full-time job. Like I was still like, I was then a production assistant covering wall street, which was like, I was so bored doing it. My God. <laughs> and I was done every day at 4 PM. But in, um, in my free time, I was going out to all these entrepreneurial things. This was like 2009. I was like, or 2010. And I was beginning to, and I was filing stories for CNN money. And I started breaking a bunch of news, but it's not like I had the title for it or the job for it. I was just literally doing it in my free time if they would let me. Um, and I, and I remember cold emailing, emailing her to see if she'd meet with me and she did. Um, and we, she always gave me great advice. And at one point I said to her, I just think we need this thing, like a digital reporter, which didn't exist at the time, a multimedia reporter, like the word digital didn't even really exist then. That's how old I am. Um, <laughs> and like, and she was like, you know, and she was like, and I was like, this person should be able to produce and shoot and, or uh, produce and write and be on camera or whatever. Like it needs to be, we need to like combine these worlds, you know, and it should be for technology. Um, and she said, write up the job position, write it up and then ask and give it to this guy, Chris Peacock. He ran CNN money, ask for what you want. I was like, can I do that? She's like, yes. And she's like, look around. Like there's so many dudes here. Like look around, you know, like you're already doing it. And so she really gave me the courage to like mm. be myself to some degree and, and asked for what I wanted and also what I deserved. And so I wrote up the job position and that's how I got my, that's how I really actually physically created the startup beat at CNN. I wrote it up and I handed it to an executive in a corner office who, who took a chance on me, but it wasn't, if it weren't for Susan, I wouldn't have, I think had the, the whatever to, to go do that. So I've had people like that in my life who I think really, um, you know, were mentors to me and, and really helped me mm -hmm. along the way. That's great. I love, I love stories like that. Yeah. Um, our listeners love to read books. So of course your <laughs> book, special characters will be in the list, Yes, please. but are there any books that <clears throat> you can think of that you read that you're just like, I don't even care if it's about the topics we talked about. <laughs> you just be like you, people need to know about this book. Yeah. This is life changing. I mean, the book that changed my life, honestly, and this is so cliche is like, <laughs> I feel like a female who loves writing, who's in literature and <laughs> journalism, like, was uh, Joan Didion, like slouching towards Bethlehem. It's like a collection of essays um, from Joan Didion, who just like Joan Didion, who was just like my hero. I can't, I just like, she was just, I can't believe like she's passed recently. Like she just was such an incredible writer. Um, 
And Slashing Towards Bethlehem has these like incredible essays that just like capture people. And and I remember when I was in high school, um, I had this English teacher um, and and uh, Miss Simpson. Oh my God. And I remember like you had to write these strict five paragraph essays. And if they didn't, if they weren't strict five paragraph essays and they didn't look and feel a certain way, she just like wouldn't give you a good grade on them. And there was no <laughs> creativity and there was no voice. And I got to college and like one of the first books I read that just transformed it all was Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And it was Joan Didion, who was just this incredible, was this incredible writer. And everything about how she wrote was just like rule breaking. She used like her sentences were too long. She used like too many conjunctions. Like she just captured people. And, and the way she captured like a universal theme with specifically talking about people was so beautiful. I mean, I remember reading like she wrote an essay about a woman who got married in Vegas. Like mm-hmm. it's just like – and she was just like in, just this incredible writer. And and so I, I think her – whenever I'm looking for inspiration, I reread um, some of her stuff. I just loved her voice, you know, like her, Nora Ephron. Like I just like those are people that um, bring me back to life. <laughs> I've, we've never had that suggestion, so I love it because it's, you said it's cliche, but it's not. We've never had that suggestion on the podcast, so Amazing. it's a brand new book Great. that will go on the list. I Please. love that. Um, if people want to follow you, if they want to know more about what you're doing next, where where can they go? What's the best way for them to to find out about you? Well, they can definitely follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all the things. It's just Lori Siegel, L A U R I E S E G A L L. Um, and then um, you could follow uh, D three Network, which is what we're putting a lot of our content out at. It's at D three underscore Network on Instagram mm-hmm. um, and Twitter as well, and then also dot 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 media. We have a lot of stuff out there, a bunch of info on the book. So lots of places to go and look for information on us. And you can buy the book. <laughs> yes. And we'll put the link to the book and all of the social media in the rate show notes. So amazing. And if you buy the book, please rate it on Amazon too, because apparently yes. <laughs> you're supposed to ask all these people to rate. Your, there's like a whole thing behind this, Chris. Like uh, it, people I know. ask for people to rate their books and everything. It's like I the know. most stressful thing ever. So please rate the book if you buy it. It, it is stressful. And, I, and, and <laughs> I'll say this as an author for Lori, like uh-huh. if you do read the book, Huh. Go go put a, a a review and and if you if you get a bad copy because Amazon yeah. dropped it in a puddle that's not Lori's fault yeah just so message don't me I'll give a you a new one <laughs> right I mean don't put a one star review because the book was bent because <laughs> it's not about the quality of the book I will hand deliver you a good one if that happens right <laughs> I got I got a few bad reviews because like Amazon delivered a wet book and they're like no. this book came wet I hate it I'm like but. That's not about that's the book. It's hilarious. You know, like, that's terrible. That, like, I, I, was, that. I was looking at Goodreads and someone gave like a one star review three years ago. I'm like, wait, the book didn't come out three years ago. It came out a month ago. There's a glitch in the system and it's like bringing me down. I'm like, who can I contact from there? This is like not even a legit you review. Know, I learned after my, so my first book, I went and read every review and I would get myself worked up uh-huh. and people would say horrible things. Uh-huh. And I learned, you know what, just l- let it go because there's going to be more majority of totally. good things that people say. Totally. And you're always going to have someone who just wants to say something mean for whatever mm. reason. But but there's nothing better than like when something you write and something that was hard for you to write, like I feel like relates to somebody or you get yes. some of these stories and it's it's really cool and it's, it makes, you know, writing kind of worth it. So um, Right. It was it makes all being vulnerable, it. right? You're That's putting right. yourself out there, and now right. someone's going to read that and go, "I'm in empo- like just like what Susan did for you." Yeah, someone That's else right. is going to feel empowered now to That's take right. that risk because of what you did. That's right. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I think they will. Uh, wow. It was so great chatting with you, Lori. I, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. Of course, anytime. It's so good to be here with you. Um, so, everyone, I hope you enjoyed our chat with Lori, and you can join us next month for another amazing, great interview. Please check out the show notes where you have all the links for Lori there. And you can follow her. Definitely buy the book. I have my copy on Kindle right here. It's wor- it's 100% worth reading. It will uh, really encourage you and give you some inspiration. So um, pop down comments there. Let us know what you think. And I look forward to talking to you all next month. See you.